Welcome inside another edition. This is Cross Functionality, the show connecting coaching, baseball, softball, male, female, hosted by former college baseball and softball players. Episode 18. And of course, if you're just stumbling upon our show, thank you. We do greatly appreciate it. Please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Google, Spotify, and of course, watch the show on YouTube, the Softball Strength Academy YouTube page. Let's give a warm welcome to newly married friend, co-host, national champion at the University of Alabama, current day renowned coach, Cassie Riley Bosha. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs> Welcome back, of course. Episode 18 today. Last week, we had your former head coach, Pat Murphy, on the current day head coach at the University of Alabama. Led your team, your softball team, to the 2012 National Championship. I didn't. I, I found this out last week, and I got to get your reaction to it. He said this on the show, that he was ready to leave after the 2011 season, signed a contract with LSU, and then decided to go back on that and return to the University of Alabama and coach you guys in 2012. And he mentioned that one of the biggest reasons as to why he did that was your senior class. That has to make you feel pretty good, by the way, knowing that he came back for your senior class. For sure. And it was definitely um, it was neat because we were. I don't think any of us thought it that way. I don't think any of us was like, oh, how could he leave this senior class? It was just we had been you know, pretty tight knit. We had formed some pretty cool leadership roles. And I think everyone was excited about that year because we thought, okay, we have all the leadership factors, all the team chemistry factors in place for it to really happen this year. So it was almost like a little bit of a blow to think like, man, are we, are we, would we still be able to do that if he wasn't at the helm? And, and the answer is, you know, probably not. Right, right, right. And the, the thing that surprised me with him when he talked about that and, and he made the decision, a big por- a big chunk of his decision was based off of girls who were 21, 22 years old and your senior class and the impact that you had just on his coaching career in general. But also, too, it seemed like there was some unfinished business. We've talked about it on this show before. We did a whole episode on the 2011 season, how much of a struggle it was for you. So a part of him, I think, was thinking, and I don't know, I mean, this is just what I've gathered, is that there was some unfinished business there. and We have to go in 2012 go ahead first and try to win this thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, I've, I've alluded to as well that um, we wanted to be the first in the sec. And Mm -hmm. I think, so there was this little extra incentive and almost like a little bit more of a race to be like, okay, we don't want, you know, it's not just that we want to win one or two national championships. We want to be the first. So it was like, there really was a race. And I think every coach in the sec kind of felt that, especially Murph who had been there from the start, I'm sure Tim Walton at Florida, I'm sure the weeklies who are at Tennessee, they had been there since really the beginning of the program's history. So everyone wanted to be the first. And so there was not only that unfinished business, but the also a little bit of pressure there. Yeah. Well, be sure to, and again, he was at your wedding last weekend, Pat yes, Murphy, great guy. Um, so we do appreciate Pat filling in for you last week, episode 17. So please go back and listen to that. Watch it on the Softball Strength Academy YouTube page as well. And follow us on social media at Jim Tara and at Coach underscore Cassie RB on Instagram, at Coach Cassie RB on Twitter for some great content. All right, let's get into today's show, episode 18 talking about creating a training calendar throughout the year. And I'm going to ask a question here, Cass, that I think a lot of people are wondering, what kind of software do you use to create a training calendar? (laughs) Excel, Microsoft Word, Adobe products, which charge you an arm and a leg monthly Mm -hmm. to use. (laughs) Um, Okay, so functionally, I will use Google Sheets because I've become very familiar with using a lot of functions, getting a lot of automations to, to run there. And then visually, I will probably represent that to a prospective athlete or um, a team of athletes on something either called Figma, which is an online software to, that helps you kind of create workflows, just a very simple way to make something look nice, um, or Keynote, which is the Mac version of PowerPoint. So it's a way, again, to display hopefully uh, important and sometimes convoluted information, make it seem really simple and clear to someone. Um, so like I said, it would it'd be both of those. 
Okay, so when we talk about creating a, a training calendar for athletes, let's let's be clear about this too. When I add full context, we're talking about baseball and softball players, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's when we talk about creating a, a training calendar, creating that that training plan for them throughout the year, and really that off season begins October, November, December. But I'm guessing that you see a lot of athletes who also play other sports. You know, a, a bat, football, for example, male on the male side, soccer mm -hmm. on the male and female side. So how do you create a plan? around that when that off season is beginning October, November, December time, depending on when you played or if you played football. Sure. Yeah. And I think that is, that's really difficult is when does that off season officially start? And I should also right. mention too, like you're not going to be creating a training calendar for someone who is kind of hoping to train one time a week. This is someone who is very serious, very committed. They're looking to uh, play very high level high school, eventually go on to play college. Um, and they are really saying, okay, I'm committing myself to a full year calendar uh, of this. Um, so not only does fall ball for another sport complicate things a little bit, fall ball for the current like sport. So people, you know, just about every softball athlete is going to be playing fall ball. Baseball, it's not as of an important recruiting time as it seems like it is for softball. Um, but, and, and I would say too, if you are a pitcher in baseball, this would be the one time. If you're trying to pitch at a division one level, you're probably not playing other sports come your junior year in high school. It's probably too much of a demand for you to not be training. Um, again, if you want to be a division one baseball pitcher and, and potentially go on further that, so that, that is the, the couple of like caveats I'd say to that, but yeah, we're, it, it, it certainly, uh, when, when you start that clock is tough. Um, I have girls that are playing still this weekend. So that means they're off season when we can really start doing some uh, strength training, really start diving into re rewiring their swing. We can't start that until their fall season is over. Um, so typically we can get that month of November in, but sometimes we lose it. But November, December is really when we want to start um, going, going strong with their off season training. Okay. So from a coach's perspective, when do you begin to create that, that training calendar for them? Cause every athlete's different. Some are not playing fall sports. Sure. I think you can have a template. And I think every coach who's been doing it for a while has some type of template of, okay, this is typically what I'm doing with a, maybe a high level athlete come fall season. And once you get an opportunity to sit down with that athlete in uh, probably August. And the reason I say August is um, they play their spring softball or baseball season in when does that start? So April, May, and then a little bit of June will be their spring season. Their travel season usually overlaps that and goes June, July, and the beginning of August. And then there's either a two to three week, sometimes even four week stint where the athlete has off from softball in August. That's when you want them to decompress, take a second to get away after they've just had their biggest, you know, run of their season and then come mm -hmm. back and say, okay, let's reflect on the last season. Let's create, um, where we want to be based off of our, what we're going to train for this season. And then let's start to create some milestones. Let's start to create some pockets of training. Let's figure out what your upcoming schedule is. Cause again, two tryouts are happening. So depending on what travel team you're playing for, that also dictates your, your calendar. So August is a big month for, for prepping for that. Okay. So then you go from August to September to October into October. How do you deal with players who are coming off being injured? Mm. Yeah. I mean, one. Yeah. an injury can happen right at any time. So just like anything else, it becomes like you kind of scrap what you had, right? You crum crumple up what you, what you had mm -hmm. and you start to figure out, okay, how bad is this injury? How much attention does this injury need? Cause sometimes, you know, an injury can of like a, let's say something, I'm trying to think of something typical, like a, um, let, let's Hamstring. say an ankle sprain. Oh, okay. Hamstring. Or hamstring. Yeah. yeah. Ham Something hamstring. that's nagging, that nagging. Injury. Exactly. Nagging. It's not, it's not an acute thing that necessarily is a break or, or like a torn ligament, whatever it may be. So something that's nagging, they can still do most of their training with modifications. So really we just need to modify the current plan. We have something that is very like uh, serious that requires surgery that requires time off, whatever, for whatever that may be. Honestly, I think concussions are probably the hardest thing to come back from hmm. because it is so difficult for an athlete themselves to be like, all right, am I just kind of a little bit tired today or am I extra tired, extra fatigued because my brain isn't healing? Hmm. You know, that's, that's the hardest thing for us to manage coming back. But what you do is you say, okay, do I need to completely scrap what we've had or do I need to just modify yeah. And again, you do this long enough and you work with professionals long enough. We have a tremendous sports chiropractic uh, individual, Dr. Brett 
uh, Poneros in our building. And if I ever need a guest to talk, he'd be another phenomenal guy Mm -hmm. where he has made it his job to be like, okay, how do we take the current plan and just, and here are the exact modifications we need to do in order for him to, or him, this female or male to get better, but also still continue on their training plan. So again, it's, it's just adapting. So what about, okay, when we're talking from the offensive side, from the hitting side, both baseball and softball, when are you starting to look at certain mechanical adjustments within that, or or at least putting it into your training calendar to then being able to progress to other little things like the mental side or small other mechanical adjustments that you need to tune up for the beginning of the season? Sure. Uh, So I really do feel like if there's something to rewire, if there's something that we need to make a a significant change on, Mm -hmm. we want to try to get that done before February. We want to try to really make sure that is fleshed out, but we also have to identify why that's happening. If someone's not achieving really good connection, right? They're losing their hinge pattern throughout their swing. That might not necessarily be corrected in the batting cage. That might be something that we need to correct in the weight room. And so we need to identify that. And depending on the reasoning, some people are just have grown really fast or don't possess enough lower body strength to hold themselves in certain positions. That might take a little bit longer than, you know, a cage or time or two to, to correct. Um, so, you know, you try to go through those rewire mechanics early on. Um, you try to address them early on, try to figure out why and, and you know, follow along the plan. Because here's the other thing, too. As a coach, you want to trust your professionalism and you want to say, OK, this has was this is what we feel it is. This is the plan we think it's going to work. But we need to retest pretty frequently to make sure we're right, too. And we're not, you know, going down the wrong path. So that's usually the time frame of when I'm really trying to focus in on that, because I don't want to get to right before season and have their, you know, Hey, we have all these issues with our swing, but then we're also trying to build speed and power at the same time. It's the one will run into each other uh, almost too often. Well, when do you, when do you um, go over your templates? What's what's a good time and and to go over those templates and kind of make adjustments if needed? Yeah. I mean, you could, you could argue that you're kind of always evaluating and and adjusting, you know, but to, to say like, okay, I'm, I'm completely revamping this. It's, I think one, you get an, an, a, an athlete that you've never had before. So I'm probably working with one of my highest level athletes um, out of the Northeast um, in Ava Papaleo. She's a freshman who's got ranked fourth in her class. As far as her dedication and her talent level and her strength levels as a freshman, this is certainly something where I'm like, okay, I get to almost create a new template for this because she's an outlier. That's got to be fun too, right? Oh gosh, yes, it's it's <laughs> fun and it's also like you know I, I always think of the the quote where it's like with much uh, uh, responsibility or with uh, what's the Spider Man quote where he's he says with uh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Anyway, it's a big responsibility. With too. great power comes great responsibility. Yes. So it's like, hey, you're afforded this ability to train an elite level athlete who has a dream of playing high level division one, who has a dream of winning championships. And that's amazing. But at the same time, you you say, OK, well, I want to help them get there in the, in, in the best way possible. And, and anytime you do have those athletes, you're looking for the tiniest of improvements because they're already at such that high level. Um, but in the same breath, you get someone who comes in and really wants to make their JV team as an eighth grader. And that can be equally as rewarding to see them work just as hard and, and follow along a similar plan with, with appropriate adjustments. So to answer your original question, I'd say right before those meetings happen in August, um, probably throughout like, you know, end of July, beginning, beginning of August, I'm like, okay, what did we have to change? Maybe is there like, did the fall season get expanded? Did, you know what, we tried this last year and my athletes really didn't, didn't feel that great going into their, their high school seasons. What do we have to change to adjust that? You know, so that's usually when I'm asking those questions. Okay. So I've heard before from strength and conditioning coaches that they love making out workouts. It's one of their favorite things to do in the entire job and their entire career. Do you enjoy creating a training calendar as much as you enjoy creating these type of workouts and then executing, having the ex athletes execute these workouts? Hmm. Okay. I, it seems like it seems like it's it's a tangled web of stress, <laughs> but it could be fun at the same time. Yes. Okay. So yeah. I love creating the overarching outline. Okay. And then I love going into a day to day, having like a a template, and then getting really creative, like on the day of the workout. Hey, how are you feeling? How's our power level feeling? How's this? And then getting really creative with making adjustments mm-hmm. to what that workout might be. 
What I don't love is trying to get really detailed long-term. So like, let's say you're trying to figure out this is what the athlete's going to do on day one. And then exactly what the athlete's going to do on day 100. Not like, Hey, this is the overarching look of the, the category, but like really try to get in the details that that becomes cumbersome. And I almost, I almost get frustrated doing that, which, cause you know, Hey, what, whatever happens on between day one and day 20 is going to affect day 100. But I at least have to have some type of template of what I think might be going on. So sometimes the nitty gritty, like trying to plan out the future gets frustrating because it is impossible, obviously. But yeah. Um, yeah, the overarching plan is fun. And then I think getting creative within day to day with each athlete is a lot of fun, but I, I don't, you know, I, I do know some strength coaches who will take 365 days and have a workout plan for almost every single day in an Excel spreadsheet. And it's so impressive, but that is probably just not me. <laughs> well, you know, there's apps for that now too on yes. the training side. I'm mm -hmm. sure you know about that where coaches plan out the workouts years and sometimes years in advance. It's pretty incredible. Yep. Anyway, so uh, looking at when an athlete enters their a certain phase of their training calendar, right? So let's say like after the holidays into January, let's talk about the mental side a little bit. How do you get that athlete prepared mentally? And how do you work that into your training calendar to get their mental side tuned up for the beginning of the season? Sure. So especially come January, we talk a lot about delayed gratification and mm -hmm. we talk about the marshmallow experiment, which I don't know if you're familiar with, but that's where I'm not. Please explain. Yes. OK, so this was another Coach Murphy thing. There, you see these uh, toddlers. Um, they're sitting in a room and they get handed one marshmallow. and They say, OK, listen, if you eat this marshmallow before I come back, they're going to, you know, the, the lab, the person in the lab coat is going to leave and come back. They're like, that's the only marshmallow you get. But if you can wait and not eat this marshmallow, by the time I come back, I'll give you another marshmallow and you can have two. So you see these little toddlers like sitting there and some of them are like sniffing it. They have to look away. They're like pushing it to the side. So it becomes, becomes a very cute video. But what, and you know, and then other times you see some toddler, the second the lady leaves, she, he just pops it in his mouth right away. Yeah. And what they did over the next 15, 20 years was track these individuals. And it's crazy to see that delayed, like the ability to, believe in delayed gratification, how much that affected grades, that how much that affected their earnings, how much that affected so many different things in their life. Um, and really training is delayed gratification. Training in the Northeast for a spring sport when it's, you know, 20 degrees outside, you haven't been outside in two months and you have to try to be like, all right, I'm going to go to the weight room again, make myself feel sore and not, you know, tired again, work on this tiny little thing with my swing again, in order for me to just play in the net, you know, outside maybe in the next 70 days, you know? Um, so you really have to hone in on, okay, I'm doing this now for a reward later on. Um, so that's really the biggest piece of the mental game that we're, we're approaching come January. Okay. So then we get into the season here mm -hmm. and physically it's just pretty much working on maintenance, mm -hmm. which is kind of a, it's a, tough, it's a tough thing at times, right? Working on that maintenance, trying to figure out where, where do we need to maintain? Where do we need, what, what quick adjustments do we have to make? to get better and to get to our main goal on the field. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's funny. It, it really does depend high school ball. At least it depends on um, the athlete's schedule. i we have some athletes who come in early in the morning during season to get their lift in. And, and again, I think people think like, Oh, the lift's going to make them sore An eccentric portion of a lift is going to make an athlete sore. So the way down of a squat, uh, the way the, from the top down of a deadlift, um, when you train concentrically, that's really training your power and that's not going to make the athlete sore. That's not going to break down your muscle fibers. So that's maintaining your, your strength and power output without compromising how they might feel for a game later that day or a game the next day. So there are certain primer workouts and, and, and quick, uh, like fast twitch, if you will, movements that we can incorporate into an in-season program that a lot of athletes miss out on. Um, come season. So they'll either do that first thing in the morning, they'll have a free around lunch and they'll come for, you know, a 30 minute quick uh, tune up and then they'll head back out. But the best athletes that do the best in spring and then are going into their summer seasons most prepared have found ways and found time for those pockets to be effective for them throughout the, the season that they can get their training in still. Do you, do you work, do you like to work on fast twitch fiber muscles in season? I, I like to get the athlete moving fast in season. I don't want them going slow. And the only time we would maybe incorporate that is if they need, they just lost a feel of their swing and maybe we have them going eyes closed, slowly moving through their swing. Yeah. But yeah, they don't need to be 
moving slow come season. We need to be priming their body to move fast. Um, and the slower movements really should have been happening or the heavier movements that cause you to move slow should have been happening earlier on in the, in the off season. Okay. So let's shift gears. Now, the, as you get into the, you flip the calendar to the next training year, creating that training calendar for the next year for the athlete. How do you do that based off the results that they may have had positive or negative from the previous season? Sure. I'm, I'm going off of a lot of the feel of the athlete. Cause yeah. again, you could feel great going into a weekend and you just run into some of the top pitchers in the country and you're ending up over 12 or one for 12, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I don't, so I'm not really going off of batting average. I'm not, you know, what I'm looking at is, Hey, how did the athletes exit velocity look like during their off season, during their spring season, during their summer season? Did we see a massive drop off? Did we see some injuries pop up? If so, when did we see them pop up? When did the athletes start to feel like uh, their confidence was dropping? That's another thing I try to track a lot of is, Hey, I think I've talked about this. What's your confidence right now? Scale of one to 10 can't pick a seven. Right. And it is very interesting to see when it starts to, to drop a little bit. And it's sometimes due to like, well, you know, and here's the other thing too. If we inherently think that working out helps us be stronger and more powerful, and then we don't have time to do it, something in the back of our head is going to be thinking, well, am I getting weaker now? Am I getting less powerful? So when athletes schedule gets really busy, when they all of a sudden don't have as much time to train, when they're flying from one place to the next, all of a sudden their, their confidence going into their next tournament is, well, did I do everything I needed to do to be ready for this next tournament? And their confidence will start to drop. So, you know, maybe that's an opportunity to, uh, you know, depending on how their travel is, teach athletes how to work out in their hotel room, teach athletes how to get, you know, basically satisfy that, that need to be doing something productive and fast twitch in a completely different setting for them. Sounds like you have some classroom study built into your training calendar. Yes, we try. We try. I think any, any coach who I think has played the game or at least maybe has struggled with their mental performance while playing the game, hopefully tries to fill that gap for their athlete. Yeah. Um, Cause I do think, especially in, in, as a hitter in baseball or softball, it's, it's needed. Yeah. Yeah. Those, yeah. Especially in those, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> two of the hardest, arguably two of the hardest sports to play. You know, skill sports, I guess, is yes. probably the right word. I skill think so. Because I've always said baseball and softball players, along with hockey players, are probably the most skilled type athletes mm. in, on the world, in the planet, in the planet, on, <laughs> um, in the world. Probably the sure. most skilled athletes in the world. Where football and basketball players are probably probably the best athletes in the world, but mm -hmm. it's, it's a little bit different with baseball and softball. I think lacrosse too is, is, has phenomenal yeah. athletes, but it's, it's neat too. Cause like you typically set, you know, soccer, really good athletes. You start to see what, um, what sports like kind of coincide. Like you yeah. have like, you know, people play football or in the fall and then go into play, um, let's say like soccer in the summer. You know what I mean? I feel like those sports kind of go hand in hand sometimes across in the summer, in the spring. Yeah. And I've heard from somebody before that if you're a baseball player and you're a position player, and you play football in the fall, your bat speed actually slows down. Playing football mm -hmm. slows down your bat speed and your bat quickness. Is there any truth to that? I've heard that before. So I think if you've maxed out your strength, right? Like mm -hmm. if you are an athlete who's like, you don't need to be lifting any heavier. So because yeah. there, there's a point where you're like, okay, I don't need to be lifting any heavier. I need to get better at my specific pow like power specific movements. Mm -hmm. um, then yeah, you're going to go play football and you're not going to do anything rotationally like swinging a bat. So of course that's going to go down. But if you're an athlete who's like, has this massive gap in just base strength, like they, and, and maybe football is introducing you to some of those base strength movements, yeah. your bat speed might get faster just because you got stronger, but that's not going to be the case for every athlete. Uh, a lot of high school guys that go and play football, they probably need to be working on, again, they're like starting their off season plan maybe sooner rather than later. Yeah. Um, but that's to each their own. We've, we've kind of talked about that with other athletes deciding when to play another sport or not, but yeah. How complicated does it get when someone you're trying to create a training calendar for an athlete who's playing a different sport, you know, so they might have to go to basketball practice on, you know, three days a week. How do you work around that? It's, it's not necessarily that it gets complicated. It just, we tell the athlete, we're not going to be able to give you as specific of a, or as we're not gonna be able to give you the best plan that you could have. And it's almost like you can lay out, like if you did not play basketball, this would be 
what you'd have. And this is, you could see how you're progressing from this phase to this phase to this phase. Cause you're in here four, five, six days a week, really working on your, your whole off season training plan. Yeah. And then when you have basketball or, you know, anything else, if you have something else going on in there, well, that now you can't be doing this, this training, we're not going to even get close to the same level, same phase you would have been at had you been training with us. Mm-hmm. Now, the other side of that is you're going to have some athletes who cannot stand the idea of just training the entire off season, and they're going to need mentally to go do something else. And that's completely fine. Um, and that there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, like I said, again, it's, it's really what, what do you want your end game to be? If you want to be a high level college player, you're going to have to eventually at some point get used to what it's like to train year round. Um, if you're like, you know what, I'm really just, I want to enjoy my four years of high school. I have my, my friends that I've played with since I was younger on this basketball team. This is what's going to be best for me. That's a completely different story. Yeah. That's, that's, it seems like to me, that's where it gets a little bit convoluted. Yeah. It just, especially because schedules change. It's not like, Hey, here's your basketball schedule. Here's when games are. And this, and we're going to go from there. I mean, it's a little less with an outdoor sport, but courts change, practice times change, things yeah. change to the last minute that you, it, it, it does become a little bit difficult to, cha- to, to plan out for an athlete, what we're doing. Well, email us Jimbo podcast, 21 at gmail.com. If you have any questions and again, reach out to us on social media at Jim Tara and at coach underscore Cassie RB on Instagram at coach Cassie RB on Twitter. I'm at Jim Tara on the dying, apparently the dying Twitter <laughs> still working. You know, I woke up the other day. I'm thinking Twitter is going to be dead. Finally, my, my, my wish will finally come true and it's still there. So (laughs) reach, reach out to us on the, the, apparently the dying Twitter. Instagram's not dying. Apparently though, that's thriving. It's thriving. Uh, um, Jimbo podcast 21 though, uh, at gmail.com is probably the best way to reach out. If you have Mm -hmm. any questions, any further information on creating a training calendar that coaches and players and, or prospective coaches in the future should know about. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm very fortunate that I get to train in a building with other professionals um, that I can talk to another strength coach. I can talk to the throwing coach. I can talk to a chiropractor and a PT all in one building. And as a hitting instructor, that is so rare. And so if I want to, if I want to just, you know, there are certain times I oversee all phases of it, but there are certain times with athletes where I'm like, Hey, they need something way more specific. I'm sending them over to here. They need a more specific speed program, whatever that may be. I think it is so important for coaches to communicate even when they're not in the same building. So if you're working with an athlete in the batting cages and you're trying to work on something, and then you know that there's another coach working on with that athlete on something completely different, you guys should probably get on some sort of same page that you don't hurt the athlete. You don't want the athlete going from, a high intent program where you're really pushing their central nervous system on Monday. And then they're going to a speed coach on Tuesday, who's also pushing their central nervous system. And then they show up for their strength coach on Wednesday, who's who has this plan in mind, right? They have a completely separate plan to really push their central nervous system Wednesday. That athlete hasn't recovered at all. And now they're about to go play maybe Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So you really want to be able to get on the same page so that you can have the stressful days be on one day, followed by some type of recovery day, followed by another stressful day, whatever that may be, so that they're not stressed every single day of the week um, and taxing their system. Because that's usually how injuries happen when it's miscommunication among coaches. Because coaches are getting better. The coaching industry as a whole, you have all this information available to you at your fingertips. It's not that what any one of those coaches was doing was wrong. It was just not knowing what the athlete was doing before or after that, that becomes tough. All right. What do you got coming up at um, Softball Strength Academy? Cool. Our hitting library or hitting vault really. With oh, all I saw that. Levels. Yeah. Very exciting. It is, it is days away. It is. We are actually just waiting on our website um, server to tell us we're officially live and you'll see it on. So hopefully I'm bearing no like internet explosions. By the time this podcast airs, that vault will already have been out. On Wednesday. Yes. Yeah. So it's Saturday right now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Very yeah. good. But that's that's the main focus. And then just, um, you know, a lot of people are finishing up their fall season. So I get to officially start this off season that, you know, we've been talking about with a lot of my athletes starting in the next couple of weeks. So this is like a, like the prime time for you. This, this is like time. This is time when our building is busting at the seams. It's a good time. Yes. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> busting at the seams i'm gonna have to talk to ep about that on the lab epstein hitting podcast which i think everybody should um subscribe to as well actually on the lab epstein hitting podcast this week we're talking about off-season hitting prep plans 
So it go. coincides. The two podcasts coincide Perfect. perfectly. See how I did that right there? Tied well it all done. in with Very Thanksgiving well and everything else. All right. All right, Coach uh, CRB. We'll talk to you next week, everybody. Yes. Be sure to subscribe. Apple, Google, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Watch the show, Softball Strength Academy YouTube page. And we will indeed talk to you next week.